Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Welcome, everyone. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It's Friday night, and you're listening to Paranormal Review Radio with your hosts, Anthony Agati in New York. And me, Lucy Liebfried from Chicago. What a great show we have for you tonight. Our chat room is up and running, so feel free to ask us any questions. And if you lose sound on your player, just refresh your page or log back in. Blog talk can be a little testy sometimes. You can also send us an email at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com and check us out on our Facebook show page. New Orleans has been called the most haunted city in the United States. It's been said by many that the actual history of New Orleans is far stranger than anything fictional writers can create. Just as every light casts a shadow, New Orleans' reputation for gaudy revelry has its deliciously dark side. Our guest tonight draws on over 25 years of personal experience with demonic activity and other extreme haunting situations in her own life to explore the dark side of the paranormal and the very real dangers it can create in the lives of those who work with the unexplained on a daily basis. Aline Cristiano is an occultist and paranormal researcher who specializes in raising awareness about the supernatural dangers associated with ghost hunting and other paranormal activities. Much of her work in television includes Haunted History for the History Channel, Ghost Hunters and Haunted Highway for the Sci-Fi Channel, The Dead Files for Travel Channel, which is still in development, and a slew of other fascinating programs. Aline's print work includes being the co-author of the 2012 Hoodoo Almanac, the Hoodoo and Conjure Quarterly and Magazine, and multiple books for Brad Steger like Real Aliens, Real Monsters, and Real Zombies. Aline will amaze you with the wealth of knowledge and expertise she carries within the paranormal world. If there is anything you want to know about the paranormal world and the haunted New Orleans, then Aline should be on your speed dial. Please help me in welcoming Miss Aline Pustiano to the show. Hi, Aline. How are you tonight? I am fine. How are you? Just great. Great. Welcome to the show, Aline. So great to have you on. How was your Thanksgiving? Excellent. Spent it with family. The only thing missing was my daughter, who's in the Navy. She's serving in Italy, so I'd like to say hello because I think she's listening tonight. So, um, But otherwise, it was great. Spent a quiet day with family and ate too much. <laughs> <laughs> cooked, more, cooked more than I have in a year. So, oh, wow. Um, but it was great. I hope you guys had a good one, too. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah, we Fine. did. We did. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? I'd like to start this off because there's a really interesting story about how you entered into the world of the paranormal, and I believe it does have something to do with your mom. So can you tell our listeners what and how you began on this journey? Well, um, my mother, um, I'm, now I'm, I'm 52 now, so my mother was uh, – around uh, 30s, 40s, when the first wave of the paranormal hit. I mean, a lot of people that that come into the paranormal now think, well, this is, you know, entirely new, this is a new thing. But really there was a a, a proto-generation, and that included the people like Ed and Lorraine Warren, uh, John Zaffas, Brad Steiger, and Hans Holzer. And my mother became involved in that. Um, She was a good Catholic. We're from New Orleans, all of, you know, the entire family and all that. But she always had a curiosity about... um, you know, the the other side, especially after she lost her grandfather. So I think that was a lifelong interest, and she and an aunt um, kind of began going to lectures. lectures. It, it started out, you know, really innocently as just an interest in astrology, reincarnation, uh, ESP. She attended lecture, lectures by Holzer and, and the Warrens and, you know, et cetera. And then it began to develop into more... Um, 
I would say Maya began to, to get into meditation and sort of on the eastern side, but my mother took an interest in what could essentially be called witchcraft. Um, mm-hmm. And it was the type of witchcraft that was not, um, you know, not the old-style European necessarily, but included some, now I know, I didn't know then, but I, it included some Persian elements like worshiping of Zoroaster, et cetera. So I watched my mom, you know, as a kid, I watched her, you know, she had an altar to St. Jude. Every good Catholic has an altar in their home here, and St. Jude disappeared, and suddenly there's a picture of, you know, Zoroaster, the great teacher. And, you know, I, I was getting a little bit more concerned when I would come home and find, her, you know, everything in the house unplugged, everything off, and she was doing EVP. What we now know is EVP. She had a basic one of those old-fashioned 70s recorders and was making cassette tapes of the environment and getting reaction and getting results you know basically before that we had lived in houses where you know spirits were active but the home that we were living in then we built from the bottom up but something was wrong with the house um it i don't know whether we built it on something as years progressed and we looked into it uh we dug up a portion of a car from our front lawn and you know it was an area that had been swamplands but had been drained for development and from the time we moved in there, you know, things were just not right. So I think something was there, and then her interest just kind of peaked. And there there were two two things that happened. One, particularly with me, she picked me up one day from school, and long story short, we went to a lady's house who was a, a medium. And she was known for seances and for communicating with the dead, et cetera. But little, little did I know, she was also into other activities like ritual magic. And this particular day, bright afternoon, it was a fall afternoon, um, sitting in the woman's living room because I couldn't participate in whatever they were doing. And my mom and this lady went to the back of the house. And um, suddenly, and people will say I'm crazy, but suddenly I began to hear like a wind blowing in the house. And I began to hear voices audible voices, and I was sitting within like two feet of the seance table. She had this huge oval of black mahogany, and it was nothing on it. It was like almost like a scrying mirror in and of itself. And uh, I would hear these, I heard these voices, and it really, uh, the sense of, you know, the hair on my arms was just raising, and I mean, all my hackles were up, and suddenly I was just completely afraid. I had no idea why. Sun's coming through. I'm sitting there in my Catholic school uniform, but, you know, I know my mom's in the other room supposedly getting a reading. And suddenly everything in the room is talking to me. And then there was this huge cacophony and it kind of a crescendo. And it's almost like, if you, you know, if you take a, a piece of dynamite or a firecracker and you throw it in the water and it blows up, that percussion, yeah. it, was, it was that, that, that boom. And there was a bang, like a window had broken. Wow. And I was scared to death. You know, I, I'm sitting here and shaking, knees up, and my mom comes walking out the back, and she was very delighted. They were they were happy, you know, with, with the, whatever the results were. I just kind of wanted to get out of there. From that mm-hmm. moment on, the activity in our house just arced just dramatically. I began to see things, experience things, uh, being, you know, touched, poltergeist activity, furniture moving, seeing the dead, um, it was just amazing weight from that moment on. And now I know in retrospect that that ex- exactly what I suspect is what they were doing. They were doing a ritual. They did probably evocation to manifestation or they were attempting to do divination with the spirit. And it basically followed my mother home. And so one day she took a turn. Um, she apparently had recorded. She left to go to a dentist appointment and left the recorder on like she was normally wont to do. When she came back, from the appointment, she played the recorder, and she heard herself at the dentist's office. The entire conversation, the drill, everything was recorded like 10 miles away. This was this was her experience. She got so scared, it was on the cassette tape. She got so scared that she threw everything out, became a born-again Christian, and since now we already had a demonic presence in our house, things got, instead of improving, they got twice as bad, ten times mm. as bad. And then as I went through teenage years, so living in fear, and my mom died at 59 years old, and she spent um, every year after that, every other year, she was in the hospital for this or that illness, and she had things that were just puzzling to the doctors. And, and I watched this this is strange, but I watched she had Petualas, and Petualas actually died of the same disease. She 
she would get a disease, the dog would get it. One of the dogs, each of the dogs died. My mom had heart failure. The dog had heart failure at home. They're just weird things. And when my dad, who's like the most pragmatic person, skeptic, doesn't believe anything or pay attention, he's seeing things in the house. Then, you know, I knew there's there's more going on here. But I lived, I lived in all of my teenage years, of, uh, you know, being just tormented and, uh, you know, dealt with poltergeist activity and voices. And then when my mom finally did die, you know, it was a realization that, um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, my dad was talking about about how she was into all that stuff, and it probably accelerated the process. So, hmm. you know, seeing that the trend is now back, I mean, it kind of went out and it went into ESP and, you know, sort of new age for a while, but seeing now that the trend is back and so many people are interested in it, and I see a lot of people doing things that are just completely outrageous, like provoking, going into cemeteries when they don't even really know what's going on. You know, it, was, it just came upon me that this is something that I could share to, you know, help people understand this is a very objective reality that you're dealing with when you go in search of these things. And not only does it follow you home, but it can follow you all the way to the grave. Mm. You know what, Aline, do you think that living in New Orleans has a lot to do with the activity that you've experienced and that your mother experienced? Quite definitely, yeah, I do. Um, New Orleans is... uh, it's an old, old city, obviously everyone knows. I mean, founded in seventeen eighteen. And it's it's layer on layer on layer of history and life and you know, it, it drew it's drawn every culture, you know, every, every major European cultures. I mean, in in some instances it's been called the fair daughter of two two empires. It was the French and Spanish Empire. And it also drew though immigrants like New York in a way, but you know, this gumbo that we have of, of different belief systems and different cultural backgrounds, it's drawn so many people and, and it's layered and layered on top so that really everywhere that you walk is steeped in history. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I do believe, you know, that coming. And then her her background, I mean, we're Italian and Gypsy on that side and we also have some Jew in us on that side. And um, she was, you know, they were always open to it. They were always open to the possibility. It simply was. The supernatural did exist, and, and this was a given, you know. And, and then we were also very Catholic, so, in a, you know, in the sense you can't say, you know, that you believe in those spirits and those saints and say, well, the dead, you know, just people just die and just move on. So I think, yeah, I think it informed a lot of what my mother um you know, what my mother experienced, but it certainly informed me. I mean, I grew up all my life with Marie Laveau, uh, the Lou Daru, all these legends of New Orleans, and it was, it's it's there. You know, I mean, I know that, you know, if I go looking for Marie Laveau's spirit, I will encounter her. So it's it's kind of like something that you grow up with in the back of your mind, and people come and like you and just say, well, you know, do you think it's real? Well, of course it is. <laughs> you know, it's New Orleans, and, and that's real. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you hadn't gone into the supernatural field, you know, being a paranormal writer, researcher, occultist, where do you think you would have ended up? Would you still be a writer? Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've always had that skill, and it's my native compass. And uh, I believe I would have ended up more in a, a strictly mundane history type thing, history and folklore. That really draws me, um, particularly medieval history, but the medieval and folklore myths of Europe and the way they translate into our culture as well. And I think that's, uh, I know for a fact, that's where I would have ended up. That's what I was studying um, at university. So um, that has always been an interest in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't, I think no, no matter where I was, I would have had, it would have naturally led to um, an interest in witchcraft or the expression of the occult um, in in a cultural sense. So I think I would have come around to that anyway because that intrigues me most of all. It's, it's uh, you know, our relationship with the supernatural world through history and how we relate to it now and how it's not changed for so many years or how it has changed, you know, through generations. So it's always been an interest of mine. Okay, so, <clears throat> Aline, when, when we mention New Orleans, the first thing that usually pops into everyone's mind is voodoo. What's mm-hmm. the current world of voodoo in New Orleans? Voodoo right now, um, like any other magic culture down here, it's a pretty mixed bag. Um, but there's an understanding now. Um, we've gotten that reputation for being the city of voodoo. Now, um, when we speak of voodoo, 
there's a delineation, um, and it's beginning, voodoo itself is beginning to gain the respect, at least peripherally, of a religion, which voodoo is a religion. What is um, notorious about the practice of voodoo, and that goes into, you know, its its expressions, is really w- would be more correctly called hoodoo, which is mm-hmm. a native sort of a native folk, a natural folk religion that is attached to, you know, our culture. Um, Voodoo, the religion and practice of Voodoo came here with, obviously, with the African diaspora, the slaves from West Africa and through the Caribbean as well. And when these practitioners or these um, African and Africans understood, they came to understand our native culture. They encountered Native Americans here and they encountered the other European basically cast offs like um you know the Acadians, the Cajuns, uh, French gypsies. Basically Europe was, you know, dumping a lot of, you know, their their col- colonies were filling up with uh, their workhouses and their poor and all. So when these cultures came and, and reacted to each other, what you got was basically a distillation of like a natural practice. Mm. And it was natural for the Africans and the Native Americans, who are both displaced cultures, to kind of, um, you know, join their forces against the religion of the, of the European. They saw that basically, as understandably, as their enemy, and they didn't understand that Christian God. And so what you got was basically an amalgamation of the, the Native practices along with the African practices and a very American and then very Southern expression of a folk religion that really, really works. I mean, if someone says voodoo, you kind of go, oh, oh, but somebody says hoodoo, you go, what? <laughs> and, you know, you right. see that, that that can kind of scare you. And, and hoodoo is where you get the practitioners who will use um, voodoo dolls, graveyard dirt, um, black cat ritual, looking for the bone for invisibility. It's really in that, that hoodoo lexicon, whereas voodoo is the worship, the practice of the worship of the spirits, um, ancestors as well as the African spirits, the Lua, and then syncretized with Catholic. You see a lot of that crossing over where, you know, you'll see us with saint candles, but we're actually, you know, it's on a voodoo altar. There's right. a lot of interchange because slaves having to hide their, their actual faith, they attach Catholic fixation to. So, um, but hoodoo is a little bit, a little bit more dangerous, it's visceral and it's immediate. And so, you know, if you if somebody's working hoodoo on somebody it's then it's a problem. <laughs> then we're then we're kinda of worried about that. <laughs> well you, you you mentioned this before and you know, we're no, noticing that more and more younger generations are, are interested in the dark side of paranormal. And and I can understand that enthusiasm towards that side it, it's it's sort of like that taboo you know you you it's something that you can't touch and so obviously it's going to entice you more you know like the demons the exorcism and the voodoo like you just mentioned can you sort of set the record straight and hopefully tell our younger listeners about the dangers of the darker side of the paranormal um very definitely um one thing i guess i'll go in reverse kind of and address demons first because um one of the things that i you know people say oh you defend demons and i say not really um you know you have this you see on tv you know you'll have people investigating and then somebody will go it's demonic you know and they they scream demonic as as much as we scream witches you know back right. in the English, they go straight to demons and they don't have the understanding um you know that the spirit world that surrounds the earth is so full of spirits and many of those spirits have been out there in basically the outlaw country uh, of the lower etheric which is close to the the physical realm they've been out there for so so long some of these spirits that you know they're ruined themselves as you know the historian says that they're ruined and they don't cease to ruin others um and they resist the process, the, the passage through death and, and moving on to the next adventure, you know, that awaits them on the other side. And so they become devolved. And so a, a number of times when you're dealing with these really seemingly demonic cases, they are in, in these discarnate humans who are so devolved, these, these spirits that are out there, they are almost indistinguishable. And they are basically when, when religion says the devil or those are devils, they are almost indistinguishable from devils, but they're not natively demons. When I say a demon, I'm talking about 
Belial, Asmodai, Lucifer himself, these hypercosmic demons that live, um, they're equal in strength to God, but thankfully they're kept out of our reality. We can go and find them, but thankfully also it takes a lot of preparation. It takes draconian preparation. It takes exact ritual, and it's basically what I'm talking then is necromancy and ceremonial magic. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into a place and you say, oh, it's demonic, and everybody starts thinking Belial's following them around, or you've got, you know, whatever, murmur, you know, this other demon, or whatever, whichever one, Pazuzu is another one that's, that's, you know, popular because of the actions. It takes a lot of effort for us to break through physical reality to contact them, and we have to invite them in, those demons. Taking them out of the equation, the spirits, like right now, there's millions of people dying, and their spirits are passing on into you know, the spirit realm. And these spirits are around us all the time, and not everybody is ready to go. A lot of people take, you know, your spirit personality, which makes you you, when your body dies and you wake up on the other side, you just pass into the consciousness of the other side. Well, a person who's not ready for that, a person who, you know, is just fearful of death, or for whatever reason maybe fearful of what religion taught them about heaven, hell, or what's awaiting you on the other side, they're going to try everything they can to hold on to that physical reality. And there are others, you know, we have addicts, people who are addicted to gambling, addicted to food, addicted to sex, addicted to everything that makes up the physical reality that we know, and they will resist passage. And the best way for them to interact or to live, to continue to exist, is to live vicariously off of an actual living human. And so this is what is called attachment or some people will say walk-in. But the other thing that needs to be understood is, these. yes, these spirits can attach to you and follow you home, but they themselves, in their reality, are being attached by other spirits. And so you have this this, uh, this layering and this attraction of other spirits, and wherever there is the pollution of spirit activity um, from larval-type spirits, which um, I can... I'd like to get into a little bit on orbs, but the larval type feeder entities all the way up to an actual fully, you know, a devolved discarnate that's making hell in the atmosphere. Wherever you have that, you know, it's going to, it increases, um, you know, a hundredfold. It increases and it feeds off of itself. And eventually it attracts things that, you know, you, you just don't expect. So you have a team. Let's say you have, you know, the very first thing, you know, I know a team. I work with a team. The very first thing you want to do is go in the graveyard. You know, let's go to the cemetery, and we're going to go take pictures, and we're going to take our, you know, our digital recorders like they do on TV, and we'll go, you know, out in the cemetery. People, if from an occultist point of view, that's one of the most dangerous things that you can do. I don't go in cemeteries unless it's to visit my mom's grave or to show somebody one of our cemeteries, and I always use, you know, I always cleanse myself after it because, it's not just the dead in the cemeteries that we're, you know, that you need to worry about. It's they're the last ones. There's there's just shells of the dead there. It's what's in there with them. It's it's what's feeding on their decomposing energy. It's what's feeding on their decomposing bodies. Um, when people, you know, nowadays the trend is to dismiss orbs. Well, yeah, there's there's a great amount of you know photographic evidence that's that's just fluff, and it's it it isn't. You know, it isn't what they say it is, and so orbs right. come kind of down. But in, like, you know, 10% of those you really need to study and look at because the lowest form of spirit energy is the larval spirit, which is basically the seed or the amoeba, the kind of Pac-Man of paranormal, of the spiritual world that will feed on that energy. It's attracted to... Uh, sickness, you'll see them in hospitals, you'll see them in nursing homes, you'll see them in ho- hospices, situations where someone's dying, mm-hmm. where um, where there's garbage and dec- decomposition quarters, homes. Uh, they feed on this energy that's decomposing. And when you get enough of them, you'll find them in cemeteries, when you get enough of them, they attract the basic and raw elemental energy. The, the, the elementals are attracted to their feeding so it's sort of like you're driving on a highway and you have that rubbernecking thing, you see a wreck, you're going to look. It's the same thing, on, on you know, and only it's happening in the spirit world. Wherever there's feed, the feeding is good, then we get, you know, elementals. Then the other side of the coin, you can come into a cemetery on a 
Saturday morning and say we're going to do our Saturday afternoon and we're going to do EVPs, et cetera. And the night before, someone has just finished a you know a grand ritual, the ritual of the toad rite, the old European toad rite, or as it's known in the American South, the black cat bone, the ritual mm-hmm. of invisibility, or the toad rite in which your your contact with the spirit world is through a corpse, the corpse of a woman that actually appears to you, and you as the practitioner or the magician have to have sex with this entity, and the emissions, your emissions, your semen, are planted in the soil to produce ghouls or phantoms to feed the energy of that place. That's exactly the words in the ritual, to feed the energy of that place. That's your gift back to the cemetery. So here's Joe Blow coming in with his team on Saturday when the magician has just finished that ritual on Friday night, or more accurately, probably a Saturday night, so they're coming on a Sunday, let's say. And there's these ghouls. There's there's just born. They're just created. They've just stepped over from the other side, and they're there to feed on your energy. And so the cemetery is the least the last place you really want to go and take lightly um, because not only are the people, the shells that are buried there, buried with everything that was attached to them, but there are new things being created through dark art every day. See, now, I I, uh, I always thought that cemeteries were sort of the last spot or, the you know, the last location that any spirit will want to be because it's sort of, I don't know, in my mind, and I may have read this or heard this somewhere along the way, that uh, cemeteries are sort of, you know, it's the resting place and why would you want to hang around in there? But when you, t- when you just mentioned that, it sort of, you know, it clicked for me in a way that I never realized that there was that danger in investigating a cemetery. I never realized that mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because any any cemetery, uh, like we have some notorious cemeteries down here that are well-known for uh, hoodoo workers. Um, there's one cemetery called Hope Cemetery, and it's near Delgado. It's on City Park Avenue, and you can visit there if you come down here. There's a rooster that's in that cemetery that is immortal, that's been there since. And if you see this rooster... It's been there for generations, and it is allegedly a guardian of the cemetery, but it's also connected to Legba or Papa Legba and to the guardians, the Gede, who are the in the voodoo pantheon, who are the protectors of the dead. So it's very fortuitous if you see the, the rooster, but it's all around you. The cemetery is... Um, it's a poor man's cemetery. It's not a pauper cemetery, but it's like a bury yourself cemetery. You can bury your own family there. You, you can there's you know a backhoe you can use, as long as you upkeep the keep up the plot. Um, the city of New Orleans allows you to have it generation to generation, and so you will find uh, one day when I visited on uh, um, it was the day uh, the day of the dead on, on November first, All Saints Day. Um, you know I encountered a lady who had a potted mom but couldn't find her father's grave because of the sinkage and, you know, the burying over people. You will go through and you'll look at a new burial and you can find bones. And it's basically, you know, you you, you dig up your relatives and you churn up the, the, the soil. And, you know, so it's very attractive to hoodoo workers. Um, you'll, you know, I've, I've got photographs of knives stuck in graves, and, you know, there's a, there's a triple crossroads. There's a tee off, a, a three-way crossroads with an empty stump, and a lot of people use that tree and the fact that it's a triple crossroads to do workings there. Um, people frequently go there for moss, for voodoo dolls, for graveyard dirt to do their workings with. And so it's a very, very, you know, notorious place. Hmm. But by the same token... You can go to St. Louis Number 1 to visit the, the alleged tomb of Marie Laveau. Um, you can take a rock from there and take home all kinds of problems because there are so many people that believe that that's her shrine and her tomb and they go there to worship. And not only that, she's surrounded by so many other people, including the new tomb that Nick Cage purchased. <laughs> He's right near Marie Laveau. Right. But, you know, it looks like just a normal situation or just a normal cemetery with historic, you know, a normal historic cemetery, and right behind you is Madame Papaloos, one of the, the uh, beginning of the, um, the 20th century, one of the great practitioners of hoodoo in New Orleans, and there's the Mosbury buried in there, and there's you're basically surrounded by all these great 
food pressure these priestesses and the priests are nearby. So you never know what you're taking away. But my biggest fear in a cemetery is what happened. I know, you know, I know what people are capable of. And like I was saying it with that rite, that the toad rite and the black hat ritual, but the toad rite in particular requires you to sleep in that cemetery over a period of time. You have to dig out a grave. You have to find a particular grave, and it tells you, you know, what to look for, et cetera. But this is magic that was used by Aleister Crowley. This is necromantic, necromantic magic that goes back to the 15th century and hasn't changed. And so, you know, people are still practicing these, particularly left-hand path practitioners. And this is something you never really hear. You know, you never you never hear at all on ghost hunters or ghost adventures. I mean, they, they may allude to it, right. but they, they go merrily in through the gate and just tramp around looking for, you know, for whatever. And so other people imitate that. I just I was just watching my ghost story on TV before you guys called, and, you know, people are constantly going in cemeteries, and it's the last place that I would go because I don't want that kind of demon, that kind of magic, I don't want anything that's a result of that following me home. I can deal with a ghost of a human, but I don't want a Google following me home into my environment. Mm-hmm. Or a shadow entity, which is a manifestation of all that negative. You know, Aline, I've been to St. Louis Cemetery just once, and I did go during the day. And, you know, I just thought it was the energy there is just, really completely different than anywhere anywhere I've found, any other cemetery that I've ever been to. And mm-hmm. it just amazes me, you know, that people go in there. I, you know, I think I approached it with more a sense of respect and, mm-hmm. um, you know, the alleged uh, um, uh, vault of Marie Laveau. You know, I... I did uh, you know I, I left an offering you know but it was more out of respect and mm-hmm. the one thing that did I did notice as you're talking about the energy in that cemetery is definitely different I mean there's something you can feel it you really can yeah. feel it and that's from now you know her bones she was buried in that vault there's a tradition here um, that she was removed from that vault and put into another one because of the fact that they didn't want anyone to desecrate her bones. But, you know, then someone will say to me, well, then that's not really her tomb. Well, yes, that's her shrine, though. And the fact is that what you're feeling is generation upon generation, not only of New Orleanians, but people from all over the world who have sought out Marie Laveau and gone to that tomb. And so that is... Her spirit is there whether her bones are there or not because she is being worshipped there. She is being um, prayed to there. She is, she's had, you know, she, she's having um, intercession there and, and interaction with her servite or, or the voodoozy that come and worship and just people who don't really know. But like you say, there is that, that sense of respect that you're standing in front of something special as you would with a church or anywhere else, you know, but is that you're standing in front of, of something that, you know, has survived the generations. And her legacy, she really has. And she, Marie Laveau is one of the great protectresses of our city, and she's still worshipped today. There is um, every year on Bayou St. John, in Marie Laveau's lifetime, they had bambulas, which were basically ritual dances, et cetera, where they practiced their native faith and their native religion, which was voodoo. But they they did them along Bayou St. John, and every summer around St. John's Eve, which is June 24th, she would have, Marie Laveau, would have a big bamboola and a big celebration. Um, So today, Mambo Sally Ann Glassman, who is one of the the ranking practitioners down here, has a ritual around that time, as close as she can between the 21st and the 24th, but it's always close to St. John's Day. To commemorate Marie Laveau, offerings are still given to her in the bayou. Um, there's a huge ceremony, and Marie Laveau comes and possesses the priestess, and she answers our questions, and she's helped us heal the city since the storm. And so a lot of, you know, I mean, she is still interacted with and still very much alive. Now, which Marie Laveau are we talking about? The mother, the old one, the very first one, the daughter that allegedly kept her legacy, 
the, the other person who called herself Marie Laveau that was just a neighborhood person who was trained by her. We don't, what does it matter? You know, does it really matter? Because it's the spirit of that woman, which is really the spirit running through New Orleans. Um, one of our mm-hmm. spirits, but basically there's the true protectors of New Orleans. There's there's others, but, you know, every year at that time she's present and she's present throughout the year with, you know, offerings, et cetera. And so people come to that cemetery, and that's what they feel, that they're standing in front of somewhere important. If they leave a penny or if they bring some complicated offering, it's still out of respect for the spirit that is her. That That's so true because, like I said, it was a sense of respect, and I left a pair of earrings, and, uh, yeah, honestly, it was just, it was a reverent moment for me. And you know what? Mm-hmm. I totally love New Orleans. I have always been drawn to it. There's a definite deep connection there. Um, mm-hmm. The story of Marie Laveau has always fascinated me and her connection to the whole city. So mm-hmm. is there, can you just give me a little bit or give us a little bit about any of the false claims? Are there any um, just what is what is her story? What is her mystery? Um, the mystery of Marie Laveau. Uh, what I know of Marie Laveau, the mother, the very first woman of the name. Um, mm-hmm. She was um, a very devout woman. She had several daughters. Her oldest daughter was born around 1827. What I have always suspected is true is that. Her, that she kept her youth long enough that her daughters grew up. And so if not the very first Marie, the, there was another one. And, and Marie, or Marie, as the first name, was, is very common in Creole society where you'll find Marie, Jean, or Marie, this one. And so there was a Philomena and there was a Eucharist was the second daughter. I may have them mixed up. But there were two daughters. And so there were two other Maries that kept up the, you know, the bamboola and et cetera, that native faith. Marie Laveau, the mother, was very devout Catholic, went to church every day, was a nurse in the old parish prison after it was built in the mid-1820s, and she she nursed people through the yellow fever epidemic. She worked alongside of the Capuchin um, monks, alongside of the Sisters of the Ursulines, and, and she was known as a holy and upstanding woman. She was a free woman of color who earned her living by doing hairdressing, but somewhere along the way, she became involved with the legend of voodoo, and what happened with the legend of voodoo is that it became twisted from a religious practice, which she would have recognized among free people of color and the slaves of of New Orleans, into a devil-worshipping, you know, horrible zombies and the whole thing that we have today that, that underlies that. And it's sort of, like I said, it's coming into a renaissance of being recognized as a religion. She would have recognized it as a faith practice. Um, and and it's funny because you'll find Catholics today, like Marie Laveau, who'll get a candle and pray to, you know, let's say, as Zuli Danfor, or will put pray to uh, get a for help with a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's it's interchangeable. In her mind, she was not doing anything that was heretical at all. And so it, what you find in New Orleans that you, that you really uh, like so much is that it's all melded into one. And to do, to do, those, to do those two things together, it's not mutually ex- exclusive. So she would have known that. But I think insofar as the reputation went, and I could be corrected by people who know better, um, but the daughters basically kept it going. They were the ones at some point, and and others around her, who realized that voodoo could make money. You could you could make money by selling powders, potions, telling people you know you're gonna you're gonna do X, Y, and Z for. Them. And sometimes it would work, and sometimes it wouldn't. But a lot of times, you know, it, it, it was it didn't matter because the people kept coming. They were coming for that, you know, that grigri, for that mojo, for you to put, you know, a voodoo doll. And it was almost like, it was almost like a, I don't want to compare it in a negative way to the mafia, but you know how the mafia gets, you know, its tentacles into everything. She had a huge family, and I think, you know, the ones on the, the periphery of her family were the ones that were making the profit out of that and my being associated with her. So you get that overlap of 
you know, everybody's afraid and scared to death of Marie Laveau, who was just a, a woman, you know, who was a product of her time and who was very devout and who you'd want to have nursing you on your sick bed and who they wrote glowing mm-hmm. obituaries about the day, you know, the day she died and were crying because she was gone. And she's a well-known, you know, philanthropist or, or compassionate healer in the city. But the the cast of religion, you know, that it was put onto the you know, voodoo and voodoo being evil and the desire to, you know, evangelize and either become, you're either going to become a Protestant or you're going to become a Catholic and abandon your faith. Well, that kind of overshadowed and that cast a long shadow on her. But just like, um, just like you have a duality, okay, you, you, in religion, where you have God and the devil. In hoodoo and in voodoo, you can petition these spirits among them Marie Laveau is recognized now as one of the Loa of, of voodoo for good and for bad. I mean, your intention, you may think your intention is good. Somebody else may think it's bad. You know, you may want that particular man, and you may want, the, you may be able to get him if you break the, him up with his relationship. Well, it's the way you look at it. And so that duality and the problem, you know, of this not being mutually exclusive in practice is kind of what's gotten it all a bad name. Now, would I want Marie Laveau to throw something on my porch? No, <laughs> I wouldn't. That that is when you go into the aspect of hoodoo and into the darker side of you know the the natural practice of it and 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 the grigri and you know the throwing tricks and laying hexes um, were all things that she knew, I'm sure. But did she do them? Who knows? You know, um, did she know they existed? Yes. And did those around her do those things from time to time? Yes, they did. So she was immersed in a culture that kind of defined her and wrote her narrative. But nevertheless, it's lifted her up as one of, you know, I mean, she is the primary. Uh, she's still the witch queen and nobody can touch her. She's still the voodoo queen of New Orleans. You know, <laughs> sorry, Anthony, go ahead. <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't I don't think I've ever um asked this question of any of our guests. So Elaine, you actually may be the first. Um we all we all have a feeling of what ghosts and spirits may be and we all have our own thoughts about how they live in the afterlife. But my question to you is this do you have a sense or a thought as to how the spirits feel or or view us as humans? Um through yeah, I, through some through research basically, and and the the, the hints we get um, about the activities of the dead on the other side, um, a lot of people think, well, you know, there's ghosts around us and they're watching us constantly. When somebody says, well, your your mother's died, but she's always with you, then you go to the bathroom and you think, you know, it's mom. Right. Oh my god. You know, or, or or I'm having sex with my. Oh my god, my mom's spirit is here. It's not like that. Um, in a, in a good death, in a situation where someone is, uh, you know, wakes up on the on the spirit side um, and realizes, you know, that that they've been, you know, that they've died. From what I've understood, and from the, the communication of trans mediums with spirits like this, there are other entities there. There are higher evolved entities. Our spirits, our, our ancestors are there to guide us into basically what our concept of heaven is, or what where the spirit life continues. There's a great adventure of continued learning and preparation for reincarnation, et cetera, on the other side, and we just have to go with that. And in the vast majority of times, spirits do do that. But the connection, that connection of spirit to those you leave behind, your sons, daughters, and your family connection, the family connection through soul groups, basically. It's been defined as soul or spirit, spirit groups or spirit chains, they sense times of need, and so those who have had a good death but and who are on the other side and basically saints to us, basically, are dead, they sense in a time of need. They hear when we call, and so they're with us in those moments. And this is this is a basic a basis of voodoo. This is the understanding that the very first contact, um, and in Catholic faith, too, we will pray mm-hmm. to the saints. In voodoo, they will pray to the ancestors. You always contact your ancestors in times of trouble, 
I had a particular, I had something happen to me earlier this year that was nothing short of a demonic infestation, and it was it proves that sometimes you can, you know, even the best of people can make mistakes. And it was a practitioner who came to my home and did something that really shouldn't have been done, and uh, it was my grandfather that I called on. It was, you know, he's the first one, and so they're there. Now, in other instances, like I said earlier, there are spirits that in no way were ready to die, and they're saying, in no way am I passing on. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, and they will go generation to generation, and they will they will go from one one family member or from one person to another, but in some instances, in families in particular, it can form the basis of a generational curse or a generational haunting. They won't leave, sometimes they won't leave the environment, but sometimes they won't leave the blood. They won't leave the people, and they'll continue on through generation after generation. Um, and sometimes you get an attachment. You know, there are dead people. Say there's a woman having a baby, and this is actually this is actually a case that I'm involved in. A woman was having a baby on one floor of the hospital. A man was brought into the emergency room that had shot himself. He sort of put a gun in, under his chin but wasn't dead yet, but came into the hospital and died in the hospital exactly, almost exactly at the time she had her child. The child is about three years old now, and the spirit of that dead man has been with this woman since she left the hospital and went home with her child. And at first she mistook it for a member of the family or somebody who was drawn, somebody who had already passed in her family, because it seemed to be beneficent, it seemed to be a nice spirit. But as time has drawn on, now it's, as the child grows and her energy increases, it's manifesting itself. It's trying to, it's basically in a situation where it's gone from just oppressing the woman to obsessing the woman, where she has thoughts of suicide. She has thoughts of wanting to kill herself. So we're working with this individual now to detach that attachment. So as many different personalities as you have, and as many different intentions of interaction as you would have when you meet somebody, that's as, that's on the other side amplified by a multitude. So our our personalities, our spirit personalities, survive on the other side. Our soul, the soul that is that makes us alive, that makes this body alive, it goes back to the great soul. Whatever it is that animates us and that created everything, it reunites with that for a time. And our bodies decay. So everything that you know is Lucy or I know as, you know, let's say my brother or whatever, that's how we recognize each other on the other side. The way they view us, we're simply in the lowest vibration. The way that they see us, we're physical matter, but we all possess our energy and our magnetic aura. And this is how they see us, as sort of uh, moving inside of an energy sphere. And so when they seek to interact with us, what draws them is that energy that we're putting out. The reason it affects us the way that it does, just like the reason that, um, let's say, demons in and of themselves, the real hyper, the arch demons, they have their own aspects. And in and of themselves, they are what they are. The reason they're so negative, there's such a negative impact on us, is because of the way that manifestation or their self interacts with us on a physical the lowest vibration on this physical realm. So when spirits look at us, they see us as a spirit form. Guides that guide mediums look at look at the spirit form as something that they're helping or they're aiding. Or when we right. call on our, our ancestors, they're looking at that spirit and what the spirit needs. So and there's you know, there's a the duality of that too is religion. What is your spiritual need? What is your what is your physical need? And sometimes they're not equal. But on the other side, those things are more, there's more clarity, you know. But just as there is, you know, a multitude of different personalities and disorders and emotions, the same things are, are felt on the other side. Well, now, Aline, this may sound a little morbid, so forgive me, but when Hurricane Katrina came through and hit New Orleans, did anything change in the spirit world? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, New Orleans is known for the dead. As I mean, we have a very, you know, the voodoo and hoodoo, but we have all of our cemeteries above ground because of the low water table, and it's always been that way, you know, where we've had to bury above ground. So our dead are kind of like right there with us. 
And the interest, like Lucy says, she's drawn to the city. A lot of people are. And in fact, CNN just voted us one of the most, uh, the most romantic city. I think we're number one, and it's because of that creepiness as well as our, you know, our old-fashioned flavor. Well, all of the, all through the life of the city, she, you know, she's drawn people to her. New Orleans is all, it's like a living being. She's to, she's a mother to us. In the introduction to my book that's coming out, I explain, you know, that those of us who are born here. She's like a mother to us, and we know her intimately. And then there are some who visit and visit and visit, and then ultimately she adopts. And then there's some that she just kicks out. And so if you understand this as a living being, you understand this energy. And so, you know, things like our our historic cemeteries, our plantation homes, or New Orleans, the, the French Quarter itself, in that little bitty square of land, how much history has gone on, people come here to experience that. Katrina came... And it was cut off, basically. Um, the energy that fed the city, that symbiotic energy between the spirit of the city overall and the people that come to feed it, you know, that, that give it its energy, including what we've been talking about as the unhappy dead, the ones with attachments that hang around Bourbon Street, if, you know, they're basically there because of all the alcoholics and all the Mm -hmm. gambling, those right. people there. My daughter and I evacuated, and I'll, I'll tell you the best way that I can tell you what happened. We left, um, came back, and when you rode around New Orleans when it was open finally, because it took, well, even though there were still some people, there were a few people in the heart of the city, we began to trickle back, but when they opened the streets, everybody wanted to go see, you know, wanted to go see this neighborhood and go see. And she's, my daughter's very perceptive. She's She's very psychic, and uh, but it was palpable. There was a darkness over the city. There was a, a palpable shadow, even in areas where all the lights were on and there was all kind of activity. There was a palpable feeling of just this shadow, this feeling you get in the presence of a shadow entity. And I firmly believe that the energy was cut off. Their food source, their energy source, our, you know, historic spirit was cut off from something that could feed it. And for a while, it threw it into complete flux. I mean, it threw it into, you know, just a complete disconnect until it's sort of getting it back. You know, now we're sort of getting that some things that are gone forever are just gone. But that, that disconnect and our, our cemeteries were washed in salt water, it, you know, it's just sort of a... Um, not a cleansing, but almost a banishing that disconnected the spirit from itself, from its heart. And so now mm -hmm. the sinews are starting to connect again. And an interesting case that came out of that is the um, there was a case where a, a guy killed his girlfriend and cut her up above a voodoo shop on Rampart Street. And in fact, on the history, the haunted history uh, program on History Channel is going to come on in the new year, and they did a whole thing on this. It was called the uh, Zach and Addie murder. And basically, Zach Bowen and Addie Hall were a couple that were among maybe 10 people that stayed in the French Quarter in that little bitty bohemian lifestyle. He, They lived a lifestyle that was informed by just what we've been talking about, the leaving the offerings on Marie Laveau. Voodoo is right there. Uh, Reverend Zombie is right there. I mean, it was part of their life, and there were people that they knew who were practitioners and who were involved in this. And they stayed in the city, in the heart of the city. They lived in a haunted house or an apartment that was part of a haunted house on Governor Nickel Street. And New Orleans was completely empty, dead. This energy, this 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 actual shadow that we encountered on our return, they were living in, in the midst of. Ultimately, they moved into another location above the Voodoo Spiritual Temple on um, Rampart Street. And Sister Miriam does own the temple beneath or does practice out of the temple there, but she had evacuated as well. So you've got her altar. Her spirits are not being fed. Mambo Sally Ann. Her temple, her spirits are not being fed. All these people and practitioners who actually practice voodoo and, and, and have altars in their home, all these things are abandoned because we had to leave. So everyone, right. you've got spirits that are not eating, um, you know, I mean, in good spirits as well. So this couple moves into this apartment above 
the spiritual temple in about October, um, right after the storm, or within a within a few months after the storm, he went crazy, cut her up, and kept her dis- dismembered her over a period of a month. And when the police went in there, I mean, he basically well, it took him a month. Then he and he wrote in his uh, suicide note that he didn't know what was making him do it, that he was, uh, you know, he had been an Iraqi veteran, veteran, an Army veteran, a uh, fine, upstanding guy. She was a little kooky, but, you know, she wasn't anything that, that deserved to be chopped up and put in a gumbo pot. Nevertheless, this is what he did, and he threw himself off the top of a hotel. And when the police went in there, um, it was just a, an absolute scene of gore. And at the time, a musician, a local musician, was living in another apartment across from the Zach and Addie apartment. And he said the bathroom light was on for a month because that was where Zach was in there working on her body. And the Mm. police went in and they found her legs in the turkey pan in the oven. Um, They found part of her in the freezer. They found other parts of her. And they, they found a gumbo pot on the stove. And she had really, really long hair. And they lifted the top of the pot up and they grabbed the hair and when they lifted her head the skull fell out of the face basically the skin oh. came off the skull uh-huh. these two people they but you know there's a book called shake the devil off and it's a really good read um about the way the city was right after katrina they stayed and they even had a mattress out in the middle of the street and they were they were sleeping in the middle of governor nichols because there was nobody in this city. And so these few individuals that were able to stick it out or could, didn't have anywhere to go that stayed in the city in that time, I firmly believe that their spirits were oppressed and he was possessed and driven to this, this heinous act. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so uh, people that are living there now that say that, you know, that the place is haunted, et cetera. But that's the connection of New Orleans and its spirits. That's you know, it's it's so old and it's so visceral, and it's a constant thing. We're built on bones. We're built on the bones of our founders, and we're always talking about it. You know, right. our history tours downtown, we're always talking about our history. We're constant. It's, it's a constant conti- continuity or a continuum of our history, and that event cut us off from it and changed us. You know, it changed our focus. But that's just one example of, you know, just how ravenous the spirits here can be when they're disconnected from their source. You know, when you talked about that, the hair on my head stood up because I've been to, to Miriam's Temple. I, I've been uh-huh. in that building. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a been quite a while. Because, but yeah, Sister Miriam really um, wasn't even in town. She had to evacuate, and it was several months after this happened that she was able to come home. But a lot of people um, who don't know, this is this is a great example of what people think voodoo is. Some people were saying that, you know, he had done this so that he could get the flesh off the bones and Miriam could read the bones and, you know, it was a terrible ritual and it was all had to do with voodoo. It, it wasn't anything like that. And I'd like to say that absolutely publicly, that Sister Miriam had nothing to do about, you know, with it. And she was just as much a victim, basically, as they were because... You know, she got kind of swept with that broad brush of, you know, it's voodoo again. I mean, voodoo is visceral. The fear of this city, I personally know some kind of well-known people who lived here for a little while and thought that they were having voodoo done against them and packed up and left. I mean, they were gone in a week, like they had lived here for several months. They just knew that they were they had somebody was doing voodoo and they were scared to death and they packed up their stuff and they left. They left mm-hmm. town and that was in 2010. So I mean we're not talking about 1827. We're not talking about right. 19, 1904. We've got people now who are leaving because they think people are doing hoodoo on them or voodoo who are disappearing or who are going crazy still because of the constant interaction between ourselves and our spirits. No, I've met Miriam, and, and in no way do no, I believe yeah. that she do. No, she does. That. She does nothing but good. No, no, and, and it was a shame, you know. Every, I mean, people who had no information. But again, you're talking the city just coming back to life and word of mouth and 
you know, a lot of people like to run that down and just, just to, there you go, it's another example of that crazy voodoo. Well, it had nothing to do with that, you know, and, and when you really look under Peel the Onion, you really see that, the, you know, this guy was, he had post-traumatic stress disorder. He was a perfect, perfect example of someone who was susceptible to spirit attachment and susceptible to, you know, the push of a discarnate ent- entity just pushing him over the over the edge, and there's no way that th- that those two individuals could have withstood this you know, the vibe, just this heavy, dark vibe that was New Orleans for just the several months after after that storm passed. So, you know, it had nothing to do with voodoo, but it had a lot to do with hungry spirits or the hungry, angry dead. And you know, a lot of the voodoo and the hoodoo practices that keep that propitiate them keep those spirits in place. And people don't realize that, but you know, a lot of a lot of what we do, or what is done that I see done, keeps those spirits in place. And when you can't do that, you know, this is just a perfect place for them to go crazy. Well, I mean, this is you know, this is a land of voodoo, vampires, werewolves, zombies. You know, we've we've got it all down here. The Lugaru, you know, the grunge. Uh, we've got our own chupacabras. You know, I mean, we've you know, we've got everything down here. So well, you know what uh, I ask you something. You contributed mm-hmm. to a book uh, with Brad Steiger, Real Zombies, mm-hmm. The Living and Dead Creatures of the Apocalypse, and you mm-hmm. wrote about the devil baby of Bourbon Street. Can yes. I ask you, what is the devil baby, and is it really alive? The devil baby of Bourbon Street. Um, the story, uh, we had a grandmother uh, who was a, a psychic in our family, and she used to tell us that, you know, if you don't behave... She told the generation before me, really, because I didn't get to know her that well. But she'd say, you know, the devil baby's going to get you. And um, it's as real as anything. Uh, you know, there there are stories. Um, I just basically took the stories that I had heard and what I was told by my family, primarily, and just created the story. Now, you know, it's you, you can obviously see it's a work of supernatural fiction, but there are some reports of a devil-like baby that, or a baby that was a horn, that had horns, sort of like the Hull House baby, the, the, you know, the baby up at the Hull House, right. that was um, basically the result of a curse gone wrong. And there, are, in the book, you'll see there's more than one version of, of it. And so I just basically related what I had heard about it and what I was personally told, um, just created, the, you know, a supernatural fiction. I don't do I know that Marie Laveau was involved? I don't know. You know, I mean, she died in 1881. I don't know what she would have said if somebody gave her a baby with a horns and a tail. But there are individuals who I have personally talked to. Now, this is not, you know, legend from generations ago. This is personal now. You said that, you know, they have seen this thing. They have seen a child like pink-skinned that, sits near the gutter. It's almost what it is is basically it's a fetch or a familiar. Um, and they've seen it like scrabbling around in the dirt or the gutter and they say, oh, look at this little kid, you know, this little child. And when they go to approach it, it turns around and it's the teeth, the eyes, the horn, and it scampers off and it runs off. It's been seen, you know, going over the roofs of the French Quarter. And these, these are from people. So I talked to a few people about this before I actually wrote it into the story. And there's, you know, there's more to come on, on basically that because people are still seeing it right after Katrina, actually. Somebody somebody had an encounter with it. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not beyond the realm of possibility mm-hmm. for me, especially to know that, you know, something could have been created. It could just be a deformed, you know, we had a hunchback, you know, the, the and he's basically in that story as well. We had, you know, a hunchback who for years you know, walk the French Quarter. Uh, there was a mad woman, you know, who died in a ditch at the corner of St. Philip and Bourbon Street. Um, you know, she's still haunting the area. Um, you know, all these, these are these are all stories, you know, about the Axe Man. I mean, that's that's another of our great stories. But the uh, I've talked to people, I've also talked to people who've seen things along Bayou St. John and, you know, seen things in City Park that are similar to that. So, you know, that's where it got it. It, it basically is part of our fiction, but I just took it to the level of this could possibly be a supernatural creature that just hasn't been documented yet. So it kind of goes into the crypto, you know, it goes into cryptozoology. Mm-hmm. But it is, there, you know, there are different, there's a legend in Gumbo Yaya um, 
that we had the devil himself down here at one time, and they they had him imprisoned. And uh, one of the stories ends and says that you know the devil was supposed to have uh, fired a baby. And I think that my grandmother's tales about that, my great grandmother's actually tales about that, kind of may have come from that just oral tradition of the devil firing a child because it's in every you know it's in every culture. But she used to scare. My cousins especially with that, that if you didn't go to sleep, it was going to come tapping at the window. It hung upside down, you know, and you could see its tail going away. I mean, you know, so I said, that's a great story, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to write it into an even better story. You know? So, um, and Brad liked it so much that I used to put a couple of versions in there in, into his books. Well, Aline, your website is alinepustiano.com. So mm-hmm. what can we expect from you and the wonderful world of the paranormal in the near future? Um, we have, uh, with my co-authors, Denise Alvarado and Carolina Dean, we have the 2013 Hoodoo Almanac coming out at the end of the year. And um, everybody can just Google Hoodoo Almanac, but they can go to www.planetvoodoo.com to look for that. And Creole Moon Publications, which is Denise Alvarado's publishing house, is going to be publishing Haunting Tales of Old New Orleans um, in the spring of 2013. Um, it's been held up for a long time. I had, I had a plagiarizing incident, which a, a local woman stole a lot of my stories and published them in a book, and we got that all worked out. And I'm leaving, you know, we're moving on from that. And so this book has been has been coming out for a while. But it'll be out in the spring. It has. Uh, the history of New Orleans, the haunted history, a lot of local folklore, creatures of folklore, and some really good stories, including the, the legend of the swamp golem, um, the legend of the vampire lady, and a uh, really scary legend of Bra Coupe, the zombie king. And uh, that will be out in the spring of 2013. And then I, am ha- I will have a book uh, later in 2013 about the supernatural dangers of the paranormal. It's going to include case studies from cases that I've worked on. Um, that will be from Creole Moon um, later in the year. And then there will be a volume two of Haunting Tales coming after that. Excellent. Then, one thanks. last question, Aline. Mm-hmm. If there is one thing that you want our listeners to take away from this interview, what would that be? Um, if you're interested in the paranormal, um, I think it, it would be uh, in your best interest to um, acclimate yourself with folklore, with history, with the reality of the impossible, that the monsters that you're looking for may actually be real. In fact, they actually are real. And that there is an objective reality to the ghosts that you're looking for. And you should educate yourself as much as possible as if you were a practitioner yourself with what you could be dealing with. Because when you turn that key, um, you never know what's going to come out of that door. And insofar as New Orleans is concerned, I would like everyone to come down and visit and have a great respect for our history and come and learn about our practices. And, you know, we're not just Mardi Gras. We're not just getting drunk on Bourbon Street. Spend some time and and learn a little bit about our folklore and our history and come encounter us, you know, again. So I think that's what I would like everybody to do. But mostly be careful and understand that you can lose your spirit to the unhappy dead. because they're not all passing on and uh, they're not all receiving religious burials and they're not all, you know, moving on to be saints. They don't have our best interest in mind and and sometimes just having them around can be the worst thing possible. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, Anthony and I are planning to come down there and I can't wait to get back there. Um, Oh, let me know. Let me know when you come. Well, I will. Well, as soon as... As soon as we get it planned, we'll let you know. I, I, I'm telling you, I cannot wait to get back there. For some reason, my connection to that's that, right. the, to guys, the French Quarter. That's, that's exactly why we started talking. That's exactly right. When you guys come down, let me let me know. So, because uh, I'd like to take you around and show you some stuff and all. So that'd be great. Oh yeah. Oh, that's I'd nice. love it. I can't Keep wait. Keep me in the loop on that. Mhm. I will. I will. You know what? Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And, you know, of course, 
we hope that we can have you on again, okay? Oh, sure. Just anytime, that's fine. Maybe when you come down, we'll do like a, a radio event or something like that. But, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, anytime. I mean, I'm I'm proud because I see the guests that you have, and I'm like, wow, they're having me on. <laughs> so I was like, hey, you know, I follow the guy for my ghost story. So but I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you know what? Of course, everyone – for the number one authority on New Orleans Paranormal, please, please check out Aline Pustiano and her website, AlinePustiano.com. Aline, right. thank you so much. Thank you. Have a thank wonderful you, weekend. Lucy. Thank All right, you, thank Aline. Thank you, Anthony. Have a Have good a great... holiday. Talk to y'all you soon. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Wow. I could have talked to her for a few more hours. <laughs> she was great. I mean, you know, when you mentioned um, Aline to me about having her on the show, um, to be honest, I, I had not heard of her name. But when I did the research and, and looked her up, she is, I mean, and I wasn't lying when I said it, she's, she's a wealth of information on paranormal and not just segregated to New Orleans, just in general, and I'm sure everybody's realized that when uh, when we were interviewing her. I mean, it, it's just amazing the knowledge that she has, and to be able to communicate that so well and so, I guess, I don't know, the, the word is sort of in layman's terms, because I've heard a lot of other lecturers and speakers on the paranormal, and they sort of go way out there. And they don't um, they don't bring it back down to what I would call reality of of um, being able to communicate that out to other paranormal investigators and others who are just interested in the paranormal. She hits it on the nose all the time, and she is she doesn't hold back. She will explain okay. to you fully the dangers of of uh, being within the paranormal field. It it and it cannot be overlooked and. Even though she has this um, great respect towards the paranormal, she has to, and, and I agree with her, she has to have that underlying feeling or that underlying idealism of, of spreading the word about the dangers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it's just another example of what paranormal is, and it's not just a hobby, and it's not just something that you just, oh, I think I'll do this this weekend. It's a very serious thing, and we've mentioned it before. Um, before you start to investigate or before you start to delve into the realm, you really have to do your homework. You really have to do your research, and protection is part of that, and part of protection is knowledge, and she is a wealth of information. Yeah, like I, I did not know. I mean, uh, you know me, Lucy. I've said this so many times. I don't like to go into cemeteries, not because, uh, you know, I'm afraid of it or anything, which I'm not. I really respect. I think cemeteries are actually beautiful. I love them. And I sort of get offended when people go and investigate and, and you know, try and get, you know, EVPs or whatever and sit at some gravestone. To me, I, I don't know, it's my opinion, but I think that's just a little bit disrespectful. Um, I love to walk the grounds. You know, I will go during the day, um, and we've done that, Lucy, and sort of walk around and I guess sort of contemplate and think about things and maybe just open yourself up to whatever uh, may come around you. Um, but I'll always have a guard up. But I, I, I don't feel the need to investigate, but I never thought – the way that she described it to me, well, to everybody when she was talking about it, that it's not only the the recently departed that are there, the spirits that are there. It's the what's behind it that's feeding off of those spirits that are getting their energy, which you don't know. You don't know what mm-hmm. those are or what they are. And I never thought of that. Never did. Well. I, I I cannot wait to get back there. I can't wait to show you this town. Um like I mentioned, I've been in the St. Louis Cemetery number one. And when I did go, like I said, it wasn't to investigate. It was more of a respectful visit. I wanted to go to Marie Lovell's grave. Um, part of my personal research and feeling about it, I've always felt that there was something more to her story, that she wasn't this this horrible, scary person. There is an actual caring and 
like she said, she's the protectress of New Orleans. I mean, the feeling that I have about her is more like a warm feeling. It's not anything negative. And there's just so much in this city. There's so much around it that, like she said, it is a living, breathing thing. I've had people tell, when I went down there, um, the friends that I went with told me that my personality completely changed, that I was full of energy, that I just did not stop moving. And that has nothing to do with, you know, being rested or anything. It is the city. The city brings you to life. If you've got that connection to New Orleans, you will feel it. It, it is just amazing. And Aline is amazing. So I can't wait to get down there, and I can't wait, you know, to, to go around to these places with her. Well, Lucy, I've always said to you, you're almost like a sponge. I've always called you the little sponge <laughs> because every time you do go to a location, your attitude and mood and demeanor changes a lot because you you take in everything that's there. And I've always told you that you always have to try and put up a guard, and, and you've been good. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. it hasn't enveloped you in uh, in recent investigations that we've done. But, uh, yeah, you you always have that change in demeanor you really connect with the location which is why we connected because you've got that passion for it and and you allow yourself to actually be within that place and not just come in like you see those bravado you know other paranormal investigative groups coming in i'm not talking about television shows i'm just talking about regular everyday paranormal investigative groups that come in with that bravado like i'm going to tackle this place and you know I'm, Mm. i'm coming in with my you know my big guns and uh, I'm going to blaze it all. I mean, that to me is <laughs> ridiculous. But, um, you know, that, and that's what attracted to me to you. So I, I've seen that in you. I've always seen that, that demeanor and that mood change constantly with you. And I, I actually um, have thought about how this, when we do go to New Orleans, when we do, how differently you will you will react. Because you, you have a different reaction or a different sense about yourself in every different location that we've been in. I've never told you this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you one thing. New Orleans is the only place in the world that I've ever really wanted to cook. And you know me, I hate cooking. But the minute I walked into the French market, just the smells, the the spices, everything around me, I wanted to cook. And this has never hit me anywhere else in the world. <laughs> I walked into St. Louis Cathedral and immediately started crying. I felt like I came home. Um, this city is amazing, and I am trying to be good. I am trying to to keep a little bit of the wall up as we go investigating. And I'm glad you said that because at least then I know it's working. Because I do know I'm a sponge, and I do know that I take in everything. But I'm 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 trying. <laughs> no, you you are, and and you have to be a sponge. Every I mean, I, I can say at some level or degree, I'm a sponge as well. Um, and I think you really have to be in order to fully connect with a location when you're investigating. You you can't, I don't know, Lucy, we've gone on so many uh, investigations with other groups and other people, and they come with an agenda. And that's the only thing that's in the forefront of their mind. And what happens when people go into a location, when you're there to do or or you know, you've got it in your mind set already that you, you have to hear a voice and you have to see somebody or you have to see a spirit or, or something has to move. When you have that on the mm-hmm. forefront of your mind, it, that you know, you're not the only one that sees that. It's the spirits that know that that's what you want. They're not going to do it. I've said this a thousand times. They're not going to do it because it's just as though you're walking into someone's home that's living mm-hmm. You're walking into someone's home, and it's like you're demanding them, okay, I want you to dance right now. I'm not going to do it. If you walked into my house and said that to me, I'm not going to do that for you. That's the same aspect. It's the same sort of idea when you walk into a haunted location. Those spirits, that's their home. That's where they're, quote, unquote, living. And so you're going to walk in, and you're going to demand of these things. I completely disagree. You and I do the total opposite. We go in. We feel the place and see whether or not they're accepting of us before we even do anything or ask a Mm -hmm. question. And so Mm -hmm. um, even with New Orleans, I think because it's so multicultural, it's got sort of this milieu of, you know, every culture, um, like Aline was saying about the European aspect, everybody going in there with all the different religions 
and ideas and cultures. It's just a, a mix and blend. And so you're dealing with almost the entire world when you go to New Orleans because it's mm-hmm. not just one aspect. It's not just one religion. And so you really have to go in there with much respect in order to get anything back. Otherwise, you may get an attachment. You may get something that you may not have ever wanted. And therefore, that's why you have to make sure that you are aware of the dangers when going into certain places. And that's why I adore investigating with you, because you have, you understand, you understand what I'm feeling. And like you said, a lot of people don't. They don't, they they have their agendas and they go in and, and you know, well, I want you to say something and show yourself. No, the spirits are not going to show themselves if you demand it. But if you show the respect and if they're willing to speak with you, you will get you will get activity. I, I can't think of a single place where we've gone where we didn't get any activity. And some mm-hmm. of these places we've gone, we've gotten amazing activity. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way that we go in. Now, I do know that well, well I have and, and okay, and things that I've never told you. Things I have noticed that sometimes you do pick up. On, on what's happening there. One of the, the biggest changes that I ever saw in you was in Eastern State Penitentiary. Um, I, it was almost like I could just see your whole demeanor just change immediately. And it was it was amazing, it was fascinating, and it was a bit scary. But then again, I, too, I, I also know that you have such a good sense of yourself that you can always pull back. And that's one of the things uh, that... I think is wonderful. But then again, to talk about the dangers that Aline was talking about, sometimes if if this happens to you, to to a person, and you're going into a spot and you're not prepared and you're not aware of what's going on, sometimes I think that's where the attachments come because the person doesn't know how to release or how to find themselves again. Um, it's a real danger. I mean, this is not... It's not a weekend hobby. This is something that's very serious. And part of what we do here hopefully will bring to people a little bit more awareness of the dangers and of the good side of investigating. You know, it's more than just all the paradrama and and what they do on the shows. This is something that's very serious and real. And if you're going to be an investigator, you have to take it seriously. One of the things that I liked about Aline um, that I've heard on other uh, interview shows uh, is that she she understands and she has noticed and realizes what the youth, what the younger, quote-unquote, paranormal enthusiasts, you know, the, the early teens, mid-teenagers are, are getting into. And that's why we had asked that question so that she would direct it towards them because a lot of them don't know. And it's exactly what she was saying is that they watch it on television. They watch Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures and think, okay, I can do it. Nothing bad will happen. You know, at the end of the show, everybody's fine. They walk into the sunset. The the, the reality is, though, is that that, that does not happen. Um, you know, at least 60% of the time, that does not happen. There is always something that you do not realize that could be attaching to you. You could have something attached to you that that you will not have come to fruition or you will not see it come to light for a while. There's so many things out there that you just don't know, and we don't know all that there is about the afterlife and, and the spirit world. And so the, the younger generation has to understand that, that this is – this is something that should not be dealt with lightly. It should not be going into as a hobby, like you were saying, or it should not be going into as something, quote-unquote, fun, because it's not fun. It's something that is it, it, it is very dangerous and could be de- detrimental to your life. You know, Lucy, I had mentioned to you that and you're going to um, be coming to New York in, in a couple of weeks, and uh-huh. I, had men- I had mentioned to you that I feel that there's something in this apartment, in my my house. Mm -hmm. And I told you the story about the gentleman that I saw in my bedroom. It was a spirit that had come to the side of my bed, fully saw in color. This is the first time, and actually I think this is the first time I've been admitting this on radio. Um, This is the first time I've ever saw a spirit in color. I saw the face, the hair, the clothing, 
um, and possibly the height, because as I was laying down in bed, the spirit came to me on my left side, and I saw it. And it's still a, that that vision is still um, embedded in my mind. And I mentioned it to my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law had asked the next-door neighbor if there was anybody that she knew of, because she's been here for a very long time, that had passed away in the house. And he came back and he told me the story that, yes, somebody did, but didn't know anything about, you know, the way that this person looked or, or anything. They just knew the name John. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, today I was outside with my brother-in-law and uh, we were putting up the holiday decorations and the next door neighbor came out and came to me and said, uh, so did your brother-in-law tell you about the person that died in the house? I said, yeah. So I said, well, he didn't tell me what he looked like. Can you describe him? Lucy, he, she described him to a T. Oh, my God. You do not know the goosebumps that I got on, on the back of my arms and the back of my neck when she started to tell me specifically about the quaff of his hair because it almost has looked like the gentleman was in, like, the 1950s or 1960s, and it had that greased sort of... Um, uh, oh God, I can't remember what they used to call it. Um, the quaff. Um, sure. it, it, it was a, the grease quaff, and it was like a brownish, ha brownish black hair, but it was more on the light brown side. And uh, I thought he was in his thirties. She said he was a young gentleman. Um, he and she described his hair exactly the way that I I, I had seen it. And she said that um, he was actually a drunk. He was a uh, he had just got married. Uh, lived in the house, just built the apartment that I'm living in, and um, he was a big, big drunk. He was a big alcoholic. And what had happened is that he was drinking one day and fell down the steps from the first level into the basement and died in the house. And um, a lot of people out there would think, this is great. Let me go investigate my house. Break out the EVPs, break out this, break out that, break out the Ouija board. That's the one thing you never, ever. This is the first thing that I've always, I was taught when, uh, when I first started to learn about the paranormal field, is that you do not ever investigate your own home. You don't. That's the one thing that you do not touch is doing that because this is your 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 sanctum. This is your 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 place of rest. This is your home. This is your living quarters. This is where you go to for safety. This is not something that you want to start to open up because once you open up that Ouija board or even the EVP, the, the digital recorder, that is in essence a Ouija board is a digital recorder. You're opening up the spirit world. And who knows if you, once you're trying to communicate with that one spirit, who knows what else will be behind that person. And that's exactly what Aline was talking about is when you're going into a location and you're talking to someone, but you don't know who else is attached to that spirit who could be coming forward. Right. Right. So, well, I like I said, when you told me the story, it's like I'm just really curious to see how he'll react to me. Um, mm. I don't want to investigate your home, of course. I, I would never, ever, ever want to do that. But I do want to see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the I, thing. I, see, just, I... I I didn't investigate, and the spirit came to me. I don't know if it's because, you know, the spirit knows that I'm open to the field and can feel comfortable enough to come and try and um, make his presence known or try and communicate. I mean, I haven't seen or heard anything ever since then. I always hear in this house, you know, strange noises, which, you know, when you come by, you're probably going to hear them. But um, the... The idea, I guess, is that if they know that you're willing to communicate and you're open to the fact of the afterlife, they'll come to you. You don't have to use the equipment. You don't have to provoke all the time. They will come to you. It, it, it's just a matter of um, making yourself, and I don't want to say available, but just making yourself known to the fact that you are willing to communicate with them. And that single person or that single spirit will come to you. You don't need to actually have devices to open up and open up that door or open up that window to the spirit world and let in what you don't know could be behind them. Well, I'm not bringing any investigative equipment, but I am bringing my holy water. And the funny <laughs> thing about it, 
guess where the holy water's from? New Orleans. It's, yeah, it's from St. Louis Cathedral. It, it It is the same holy water I've been carrying around for probably the last 20 years. And the most amazing thing about this, this holy water, you've seen the little bottle that I carry. Yeah. It never goes down. As much as I've used it, it you never, You know, I, I noticed that because I remember when you took it out when I got scratched at Bobby Mackey's. And you started to sprinkle it on me, and and uh, you know we we said a prayer or whatever. Um, and then I think I saw you bring it at Prospect Place, was it? Mm-hmm. That was a whole year or a year and a half after the fact. That I remember looking at the bottle, and it and I, I said it to myself. I wonder if this was hers because it looked too full. It looked too. It looked because I know you've used it already, and it mm-hmm. looked too too full to be to have been used so many times before and so uh, I, I actually never mentioned that to you but those are one that's one of the things that I remember seeing was that that holy water bottle it, it's never gone down and you know what a real quick story about that that holy water when I was in the uh, the cathedral and I was there and you know I said the rosary you know me I say the rosary everywhere I go and I wanted I went to the holy water and I wanted to to get some I wanted to to bring some but I, I didn't bring anything with me. There was a woman in the church, and to this day I can't remember what she looks like, but I do remember that when I went into the church, the church was completely empty. When I turned around after saying the rosary and going, looking around, there was a woman, and she said, you can get the holy water from there. She showed me where it was. And then she said, you can also buy a bottle and I said, thank you. And I don't remember her leaving. I don't remember I don't remember anything but her telling me where the holy water was and that I could purchase a bottle. When I came back with the bottle, she was gone. And mm. that's just my little story from St. Louis Cathedral, but I'm telling you, it is just amazing. The bottle never goes down. It stays at the same level all the time. And remember, at Bobby Mackey's, I was splashing that water on you. I know. I used that. So that's just one of the little things. So I do carry it with me all the time. That's just kind of like my little connection. But I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to get to New York, and I can't wait to get to New Orleans. Well, just on to um, something else, but still on the topic of um, New Orleans. Um, today, as sort of getting prepared for the show tonight, uh, again, I was doing a little bit more research and trying to see if there was any new articles out, and uh, I couldn't find anything new that was written about anything, either it be haunted, paranormal, within New Orleans. But I did find an interesting article um, on why do vampires prefer Louisiana, and it is from the Neo-Americanist an interdisciplinary online journal for the study of America. And I think you can go to neoamericanist.org to find this. <clears throat> but then it prompted me also to do a little bit further. And talking about movies, the um, I guess within New Orleans, I found a list of films that have been shot in New Orleans. And what I found was a lot of vampire movies Interview with a Vampire, Cirque de Freak, The Vampire's Assistant, Dracula 2000, Dracula 3, The Legacy, Vampire Bats. There's a lot of vampire movies that have been based, or the films have been based, in New Orleans. And so it kind of got me thinking, why New Orleans? Why New Orleans? And I think one of our listeners, I can't remember who in chat, uh, had mentioned Anne Rice. And, of course, Anne Rice and, uh, is a infamous vampire author. Uh, I know one of your favorites, right, Lucy? I've read every single book she's ever read, including the the latest ones for a little bit, and actually decided she was not going to write about the paranormal, and actually started writing about the life of Jesus. And she's mm. gone back to writing about the paranormal, but for a brief time, um, her interview with the vampire series is amazing. I mean, if you love reading about vampires, the whole story goes, I think there's a series of almost like 12 books. She's so prolific at writing. And it goes from vampires into werewolves, and it's 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 so, so good. 
Well, Anne Rice and Charlene Harris, um, I think she Charlene wrote the Suki Stackhouse series, which is, um, I guess, another series of best-selling vampire um, books. And the, the, this article basically pertains to those two authors and why they chose uh, Louisiana, and not, not so specifically New Orleans, but Louisiana in general. And, and mm-hmm. it's not just because they grew up there or they lived within New, Louisiana, either within New Orleans or in the North area, um, but it's because, and, and Aline mentioned this before, and I've said it before as well, it, it's, it's, the place is just so multicultural, and it encompasses so many different varieties of religions and cultures and belief systems, everything. And um, one of the lines in this article, which was pretty cool, it says, we've seen so far some of the possible reasons why these writers chose Louisiana, and especially New Orleans, as the setting for their stories. The particular history of the state made it a multicultural milieu where being different was the norm. I really mm-hmm. like that. I really like that line because it basically does set the scene for New Orleans. It, it you know, the... The abnormal is the norm in New Orleans, and the the history, the sensuality of New Orleans, the mystique and mysteriousness of the place lends itself to such a great backdrop to vampire stories. And I think Anne Rice and Charlene Harris had sort of brought it to life with their book series, and many of the uh, the films that have come out you know, within the last 50 years that have been based out of New Orleans, I think lends the story to a much, I guess, um, what the word is sort of like a richer, <clears throat> excuse me, a richer grab of the viewer because mm-hmm. it is just so mysterious in, in its way. I mean, if if you've got a camera and you're walking down New Orleans, you don't need anything else. You don't need set yeah. design, you know. You don't need fog machines. You don't need any of that because the place itself, the the beautiful intricacies of even the gates of, of a cemetery, just it, it supersedes anything that else that you can actually even create in a studio. So I thought this mm-hmm. article was pretty interesting. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, you know what, Charlene Harris, her books are, the Suki Stackhouse series, is the basis of the uh, the show True Blood. And mm-hmm. one of the taglines of the show, which is it's so awesome, normal is boring. And it, it's true. Her stories go into, she pulls in so many aspects of different cultures, not only with the vampires. You've got fairies. You've got shapeshifters. You've got werewolves. I mean, the stories that she writes entail so much of these these um, legends and, and things that come from different cultures. I mean, mm-hmm. both authors are amazing, both of their stories. Now, I will say, okay, on the movie side of it, I was a little disappointed in the movie versions of Anne's stories because when you read the book, um, the things that you vision and the things that you see are a little bit different. But I have to say, True Blood is awesome. I mean, you know me. I will stop everything to go watch True Blood. But again, Charlene's stories, she pulls on all different cultures. Like I said, we've got fairies, which are European. She's got the shapeshifters, which are Native American. Werewolves, which, you know, everybody loves werewolves. I mean, both of these authors are so rich. Their, 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 their stories are so full of, of just the whole essence of Louisiana. And one thing I have to say, too, I'm, I'm a city kid. I don't like dirt. I don't like, you know, roughing it. When I went into the swamps in New Orleans, it was just amazing. There is not a more magical place to me than the whole state of Louisiana. Um, The swamps, I mean, being on an airboat, you know, I I thought, okay, there's bugs coming at me. You know, I'm not going to like this. I was enthralled. I was absolutely enthralled. And this was on a 99-degree day, and it was – I. I couldn't even feel the heat. I was just so excited to be there. So some of these films, though, I'm really surprised. Uh, Cirque du Freak, which is another one of my favorite movies, I didn't realize that that was filmed in New Orleans. Mm. 
And, you know, Nell Crawford mentioned in chat, Anne Rice humanized the vampires. She absolutely did, and mm -hmm. I think that's what set her apart from, you know, what is it, the Bram Stoker's Dracula. It, mm -hmm. She she made it, more, Anne Rice made it more more real, I guess that's the, the only term that's coming to mind right now, made vampires more real that can be relatable to the viewer. Mm -hmm. And so you became more enthralled with that person you know, when I watch Interview with a Vampire, um, you know, I, I, I don't think you like this movie, right, Lucy? No. No. I did. No, I, 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 I think this is the only vampire movie that I liked. And, um, you know, I can care less about Tom Cruise and, and Brad Pitt. But um, I, I like the way that they put it all together, you know, in the package. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain scenes which, you know, they could have done without or changed. But I like the way that they did the entire movie. And it was based on the reporter um, or journalist asking questions. And so what um, – I was just lost my train of thought now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have to say, okay, Interview with a Vampire. The, the main character is Lestat. And reading this book, and I don't know, if, if, since you've seen the movie, you kind of know the story. Um, when From day one, when I read this, Lestat does a stint as a as a rock star, you know, and I always pictured him as Sting. I just thought Sting is Lestat, and I think that's part of the reason why I was a little disappointed because it was Tom Cruise, and it just you know the story is 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 wonderful. Um, Lestat has so many human qualities about him mm -hmm. that makes him, uh, makes him. Appealing. I mean, you know he's a vampire. You know he's a monster. You know the things that he does, but he also has he has an ego, and he and he feels pain, and he cries, and 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 he he has you know he he falls in love, and he has vengeance. I mean, he has all of these human qualities that he's taken with him in becoming a vampire, and of yeah. course he lives and breathes in New Orleans. Well, I, I think that movie, for me, it showed, and this is the point that I was getting at before, was that it showed the good and the bad of the vampires. And it's sort of like, you know, even though Tom Cruise's character was sort of the quote-unquote bad vampire and Brad Pitt's was the opposite, you sort of felt sorry for both of them. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I sort of felt, you know, that uh, Brad Pitt's character and what he was trying to do and Tom Cruise's character... And the the sort of evilness and the hatred that he had, but you sort of felt sad because here he is now in present day talking to a journalist, sort of giving his story of his life, and it's and it's like they don't die, they continue to mm -hmm. live in this agony, and there's no break, there's no, you know, there's no time out, and uh, I kind of felt sorry, and I, it's, this was just the first movie that I sort of. I guess sort of not attracted to, but it sort of got me into the idea of vampires and what they could be. And may or, it may or may not be truth, but I kind of like the way that that movie was done. Mm -hmm. Nell just um, uh, in chat just said that they saved a little girl and turned into a vampire. Was that good or bad? Well, I mean, if you look in the context of the story, Claudia was always going to remain a child in her body, but her being, her soul, or her lack of it, her essence, was going to grow. So it was a bad thing. I mean, she was forever trapped in a child's body. So well, I, that, the that, story is just interesting. Right. I, I think when Ella was getting at it was the, the actual act of doing it. Should they have done it since they were elder, they were older? Should they have done that to a child, child not knowing right and wrong, especially at that age? But... Um, and I can't remember even the reason why they did it, or why that why he gave in and and, and made her immortal. But um, you know, I, and, and again, I felt sorry for her when she sort of started to get agitated and angry at the fact that she will never grow up. She will never be able to have a relationship like an adult with another human being. And again, it just I, I just felt completely sad for for all of the characters towards the end of the movie. It was just. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I just I remember that movie so much, and that's the only real vampire movie that I've seen. And uh, anytime anybody talks about vampires, that's the one thing that pops in my head. 
<laughs> well, I wanted, I wanted well, to, Lu- Lucy, I just wanted to touch on, because um, we didn't get to do it with Aline, but uh, the top ten most haunted places in New Orleans, and I got this from hauntedneworleantours.com, and I just wanted to run through these very quickly. Uh, okay. Number one, LaLaurie House, which we mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, St. Louis Cemetery, number one, which, again, we've mentioned tonight. Uh, let's scroll down. The Pavilion Hotel. So these may be some interesting stuff that we can check out. Ornod's Restaurant, Canal Street at City Park Avenue, Cafe Lafitte in Exile, uh, the Sultan's Plate Palace, which I've heard about. Is that? Did she mention something about that being where the Devil Baby is? You know what? I don't remember right now. Okay. Uh, the Burgard Keys House Hotel Monteleone. I've heard a lot about that place. Um, and then what Aline had mentioned tonight, which is sort of the number one time to go, and it's not Mardi Gras, if you are in the paranormal, it's on November 1st, and it's the Day of the Dead ritual. I would love to go there, Lucy. If you can hold out till November 1st of next year. That's fine. That's fine. Maybe, that would be maybe, perfect. Maybe we do that. That way we can enjoy the, uh, the the rituals and the festivities that they do for the Day of the Dead. And mm-hmm. uh possibly do some sort of long weekend there. But I just wanted to mention that on air so that uh, it's recorded. So if anybody wanted to um, check out some places in New Orleans or go to hauntedneworleanstours.com and check out what they have. They have the list here, and then they've got a description of the places in the supposed history and the hauntings of each of the places. So. Well, I just want to mention real quickly, a couple of those places on that list I've been reaching out to and trying to see if we can get an overnight investigation. Okay. The Beauregard Keys house and hopefully the LaLaurie house. And mm. then one other thing that Aline mentioned, she mentioned Sally Ann Glassman, who is um, listed as one of the uh, most powerful voodoo priestesses now. Um I'm hoping that we can get Sally Ann on in the show in the near future. All right, great. Do your magic. (laughs) I'll do what I can. So how about let's go on to some uh, business now. All righty. Okay, let's go to the Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week. And this week, we have one of our listeners that every time we post a new show, she's one of the first ones that always says she's going to be there, and that is Jamie Danderan Halstead of Sioux City, Iowa. A little bit about Jamie. She likes Britney Spears. She likes the Black Eyed Peas, Greek mythology, Honey Boo Boo, Paranormal Witness, (laughs) Ghost Adventures, and, of course, she loves Paranormal Review. Congratulations, Jamie. Thank you so much for being a fan. Dawa makes me holla, honey boo boo. <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you have it. New Orleans continues to be one of the most fascinating and haunted cities in the world. And if you have been lucky enough to experience the magic, you know what I'm talking about. We want to thank Aline Pustiano for joining us tonight. She is a real treasure of New Orleans. Now, if you know anything, anything about UFOs and alien abductions, you might have seen certain names come up time and time again. Two of these names are connected with some of the most authoritative information there is on the subject of UFOs. Next week... Friday, November 30th, Paranormal Review Radio is honored to welcome Stanton Freeman and Kathleen Martin to the show. This is going to be a very, very special night, especially for you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Join us as we talk about UFOs, abductions, Roswell, and much, much more with two of the most knowledgeable experts in this field. Okay? Thank you for listening, everybody. You are the best fans around. Anthony, thank you so much. You make Friday night so much fun. So, until next week, dear friends, have a paranormal week, and good night. 
Good night, everybody. Paranormal Review Radio.